Good morning, and you're very welcome to the final uh, signpost webinar for 2022. Uh, this morning's webinar is brought to you in conjunction with Dairy Sustainability Ireland, Food Drink Ireland Skillnet, and the National Rural Network. Uh, my name is Pat Murphy, uh, from, from Head of Environment uh, Knowledge Transfer in, in, in Chagask. I'm joined this morning uh, by Michael Hennessy. Michael will be, uh, I suppose, addressing the question of can tillage, the tillage sector contribute to climate resilience in, in Ireland? Michael, you're very welcome. Morning, Pat. How are you? We're also joined by Shay Phelan. Shay will be helping us with the, the, the questions uh, uh, later on. Shay, if you want to, to turn on your camera there. Um, Michael, I suppose it's a, an area because of the prevalence of uh, and because of the extent to which uh, ruminants contribute to uh, uh, our greenhouse gas emissions, we have kind of tended to ignore the tillage section and its uh, potential contribution to greenhouse gases and its potential contribution to the ability to resolve our issues with, with, with greenhouse gases. Well, it's true, Pat. That, I mean, that's what I want to try and step through a little bit. I mean, we have been, I suppose, largely... I don't put over to one side because of the fact we're, we're a low or very carbon efficient sector as it stands. And I suppose the point I'll really try to emphasize today is the fact that we can make a big contribution, not just in greenhouse gases, but to other industries across the across the broader agricultural uh, industries as well. OK, morning, Shay. How are you this morning? Fine, Pat. Yeah, fine. Fine. Call the morning this morning, please. Yeah, nippy one. Okay, without further ado, then Michael, I might get you to uh, share your presentation, and uh, I'll remind people that as well uh, to submit their questions in the Q and A. Oh, okay, yeah, we can see that perfectly. See that? Okay, great. Thanks, Pat. Thank you very much, um, and uh, very welcome. So, my name is Michael Hennessy. I'm heading up the crops knowledge transfer side of the house in Chagas. Um, so this morning, as I said to Pat, I really want to just talk about tillage and talk about the um, the potential uh, impact that tillage can have in terms of uh, impacting on climate resilience for Ireland. So I suppose before we go too far into it, just to give people an idea uh, who are listening that mightn't be already familiar with the tillage sector, to give you a bit of an idea about the size, I suppose, and breadth of the tillage sector. So based on, and I suppose all the way throughout this, this presentation, I do borrow quite a bit from various different sources uh, along the way, including, including uh, some of the colleagues around Chagas. So in this report from Michael Wallace, uh, it was done in 2020, Michael Wallace UCD, he did an overall impact of, or an overall look at the tillage sector. So from, the, uh, from that, we can see that a large proportion of the output of the 640 million euros in output uh, are from the cereal side of it, the other fairly large parts of it then are potatoes, some of the fodder crops and obviously straw as well. Uh, in terms of the malting barley sector and um, going into drinks industry, it's a smaller proportion of it, but it becomes a very large uh, export uh, and it probably is one of the biggest exports or is the biggest export um, in terms of direct exports uh, coming directly from um, outputs from, uh, from tillage crops. Other a few small bits and pieces, oilseed rapes, pulses, um, both of those uh, areas are on the increase. We'll, I'll touch back on those uh, as, as we go through the talk. Uh, in terms of the overall expenditure into the um, rural economy, there's, uh, there's a lot of farm inputs go into making that 640 million euros. There's a lot of farm investment in whether it's uh, machinery or, or buildings or that kind of thing. Uh, you know, culminating with um, about 11,000 or estimated 11,000 full-time uh, uh, full jobs uh, within the sector. Uh, and when you multiply it all out, um, uh, worth about 1.3 billion to the overall uh, economy. So it's, it's a very substantial sector that's often kind of forgotten about a little bit. If we have a look then just in terms of, um, well, what does that kind of translate its way into? And from the National Farm Survey, we can see that in terms of family farm income, the tillage sector is behind dairy in terms of uh, euros per, per uh, hectare output, but it's a, a good bit um, ahead of both sheep and cattle farming. In actual fact, most years, it's probably double um, both sheep and cattle. Um, and it's, it is, in fairness, always that little bit in terms of a euro per hectare basis. It is always that little bit um, behind dairy farming. But it's never quite as simple as that. Obviously, dairying and uh, cattle and sheep, they require a huge labour input. 
and it's, I suppose there's a bigger labour input on a per uh, per hectare basis. But when you look at the labour, because tillage isn't a, quite as intensive, when you look at the income per unpaid labour unit in 2021, the differential actually um, gets very uh, narrow between specialist dairying and tillage. So uh, for the amount of time you put in, the amount of money you get out is, is relatively similar. But again, as you can see, we're a long ways ahead of the likes of sheep or cattle farming. In terms of viability then, um, uh, which is a measure of, uh, of uh, I, I suppose, how well the overall enterprise is doing on a farm from year to year. And dairying, but obviously a quite a high income like that, are quite viable and um, you know it's it, it, well over 75%. But as you can see, the same trend as, as above the line there, um, the tillage is way above either the cattle or the specialist uh, sheep farming there. So it's you know it's it's a, a pretty viable um, uh, enterprise in comparison to the other ones that are there. And I suppose this this kind of comes into this particular uh, slide here, which basically says over here, I suppose that look, there's um, the likes of the cattle and sheep um, and and uh, the other cattle enterprises. There, this is the amount of time estimated time their their labour hours they're uh, uh, employing per size of farm, but they're slightly small, actually quite uh, smaller farmers in comparison to tillage. General average tillage farmer somewhere around sixty hectares. Uh, similar to a dairy farm, maybe slightly bigger than a dairy farm, but the, the, the tillage farmers put in a lot less hours. And I suppose that comes uh, comes back to the um, the amount of return on a per hourly basis for tillage is it matches uh, the, the dairy sector. But I suppose the other side of it is, is that you can put in um, less hours, but from the point of view of, um, I suppose, stress, and again, this is from the National Farm Survey, that you have the likes of some of the, the dairy and some of the other um, uh, livestock enterprises and um, that, that there, there, there are certainly lots of stress over the last five years and has, has it worsened over time lots of them are saying it probably has for tillage not so much we're very much down on the lower end of that so spending a lot less less time at it and maybe worrying a little less about it as well for around the same money so when you put it all together it's actually a pretty a pretty good news story and, and tillage farmers seem to be earning reasonably well and fairly happy actually doing it Switching back just a little bit, just to give people an idea kind of where, where we sit in the landscape in terms of uh, the overall area. So as you might imagine, uh, Ireland is very much dominated by, by grassland, whether it's grazing and silage or whether it's rough grazing. Uh, cereals and various other different crops are about 7% of the overall area. So we're not huge. But when you break out that 7%, you can break it down into the majority of what we grow is probably barley, either winter barley or spring barley. So it's a huge, huge amount of ground um, dedicated to that. The other cereals then, whether it's winter wheat or spring wheat um, or spring or winter oats, takes up the line, line proportion of the, um, of the overall area. But we do have a nice area of, of, of oilseed rape and beans, which are our two, I suppose, major break crops there. And both of those, as I said, have been increasing and have increased again uh, over the last year. And... We have a small area of potatoes that have been relatively steady over the last number of years and pretty much um, deliver enough for the domestic market. Maize, um, which is going into uh, fodder and fodder beet, obviously going into the livestock area as well. So when you kind of break it out, that all down in terms of overall um, tonnage or what's it look like if, if you're piled up into a big heap, about 2 million tonnes of grain uh, in for feed, about 300,000 tonnes of grain barley going into um, the malting industry, into the drinks industry, about 63,000 tons of oilseed rape, 50,000 tons of beans, 400,000 tons of potatoes, and about 1.3 million tons of maize and beet combined. So it's a, if you were to put it all into the one farmyard, it'd be a fair heap of stuff. So there's, there's, there, there's a lot of production coming off that, that very small area. So in terms of, of our climate, as we know, our climate has certainly been very cold over the last few days, but predominantly it's, it's wet and it's predominantly the wettest uh, across towards the, the western side of the country and certainly an awful lot drier toward, towards the east. So if we we're to um, look at the tillage area and you can see all of these different dots of colours here, which basically shows where, where we have um, the majority of the tillage ground, whether it's either in continuous tillage or it's rotating in and out of tillage. So it's very much concentrated, I suppose, from a line from kind of Dundalk out down, down towards kind of Mallow and to, towards the uh, eastern side of that or to the right-hand side of your screen from that, 
with some pockets, one down in Kerry, one up in Donegal, a small bit of a pocket around Galway and, and a small pocket around, around Tipperary as well. So that's that's kind of where the majority of the tillage uh, tillage would be. In terms of um, in terms of how farmers get on um, from the point of view of yields, uh, Irish farmers would be probably the the highest yielding or the highest performing farmers in the world. So this is from the FAO stat, um, which gives you a comparison of yields all the way across the world. In terms of barley, we are the highest yielders of barley in the world, uh, followed by uh, New Zealand and Germany. In wheat, um, we're just behind New Zealand in this five-year average. However, it depends on the year. Some years we're a good bit higher um, uh, than, than New Zealand, and other years we're, we're kind of neck and neck. This year, in 2022, our yield is um, rather than nine tons, it was actually 11 tons on average across the country. So it's exceptionally high yields this year. So <clears throat> we have, you know, that, and that kind of comes from two ways. One, it comes from, from that we have enough water, which we're very different to pretty much everybody else on one side of it. But we have a skilled farms, farmer set and farmer industry supporting that so that when the conditions are right, um, the, uh, the, the platform is there for crops uh, to, 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 to give very high yields. But I suppose, of course, um, the thing about that is, is that we, we, we probably do need, we probably do need high yields because of the fact that that rain gives us a huge amount of, of issues. It gives us lots of, lots of benefits in terms of high yield, but it gives us issues in terms of disease. So uh, the likes of potato blight being certainly one of the major diseases that we get, it certainly hasn't come, uh, gone away. Ewan Mullins last week in this series uh, spoke quite a bit about that. But we have other we, we, we have other diseases such as um, uh, septoria, we have fusarium, we have various other, other diseases like that, which are uh, very problematic to control every year. Very high pressures, um, but we have, um, if we don't control them, I suppose the yield could be knocked by, by 50% in, in any one of those crops and for, for, for the likes of uh, potatoes, that could be pretty much a wipeout, pretty much like the famine kind of times, if you like get very little of any, any yield out of it. So um, the other side of the wet weather disease or the wet weather that we have is that we have very narrow windows in order to get um, uh, work completed. So our machinery costs tend to be higher than maybe some of our other competitors out there in the world because we need higher or bigger machines to get over the ground faster uh, to try and get the work done in those, those narrow, narrow areas. So some of the challenges that we have coming down along the road, and, and um, it's it's there, 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 there's certainly many of them. Um, there's certainly the whole climate action across in Europe, whereby we're trying to reduce uh, emissions by 51%. And from that, we're trying to reduce the ag emissions by, by 25% here in Ireland. If we were to look at the, um, I suppose, the 2050 time horizon, um, we're, we're trying to get to, to almost a zero carbon scenario or carbon neutral scenario. So that's all of it's going to be very challenging. In terms of the farm to fork deal, um, uh, there's a requirements in there or target certainly in there to reduce chemical fertilizers by 20% and reduce pesticides by 50%, both of which will you know, qu quite severely impact um, the tillage sector without some mitigation matters in, measures in there. And the last one there is around um, the water quality and certainly the water quality in, in many parts of the country. And you can see here in Ireland, across towards the east, pretty much everywhere, a little bit coincidental in fairness in, in, in terms of um, where the water quality would be deteriorating as in the yellows or the reds, where it's not as good as it should be. Tillage is a part of the problem, um, but also can be part of the solution there to try and mitigate those, effort, those effects onto of nitrates in particular. Uh, certainly down the southeast, but also some phosphate loss from from ground as well. Uh, so look, they're all they're all things that we we have to try and strive towards trying to get right. From the point of view of tillage, and again coming from the National Farm Survey, and this this pretty much is relatively consistent over the last number of years. The nitrogen balance, in other words, the amount of nitrogen that's left in the ground, surplus to requirements from one year to the next in the ground, is calculated out. Um, by by the by the outputs versus the inputs, tillage would have a relatively low uh, balance of, of 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 or surplus of um, of nitrogen. 
uh, in comparison to to sheep cattle and especially dairy farming we're, we're very much on that side of it and the other side of that then which you would expect that our nitrogen use efficiency so the amount that we put on versus the amount that we pull off is quite high uh, you know it's it's 60 percent pretty much any year but it can go as high as 70 even to 75 percent so it can be we're doing really good on that end of it and um, because I suppose the majority of tillage farmers only apply as much as they need. And it's probably that little bit easier to regulate in terms of we, we have a reasonably good idea within 20 or 30 kilos anyway, as regards the amount of nitrogen that's going to come from the soil. So we can balance up nutrients for, for crops on a year to year basis. And I think for the most part, tillage farmers are very good at doing that in terms of creating a budget for the um, for each crop in each field to make sure that it only gets the required amount. It's a similar uh, view in terms of phosphorus, again, coming from National Farm Survey. The tillage balance um, in, in terms of kilos is, is around, the, it's on the, the lower side of all of the, the sectors um, uh, and certainly in or around the same as, as sheep and cattle farming, but again, quite a bit lower than specialist tillage farming. And again, because of the fact that we're able to match um, outputs to inputs reasonably well in all our fields and tillage farmers have traditionally been very good at um, doing soil samples and making sure they know what's actually in the soil in the first place, and then matching that to the um, chemical input. We tend to have a very high P use efficiency. So again, uh, what was applied versus what's coming off in the grain or the straw. So it's, it's, it's again, a relatively efficient um, system from, from those terms. Well, certainly not perfect, but, but relatively efficient. Then when we look at the greenhouse gas emissions, um, uh, as, we, as you would know it, or our, our CO2 equivalent, equivalent emissions, again, it's another good news story for tillage. Um, from a tillage point of view, again, coming from National Farm Survey, we're very much on the, on, on the very lowest end of all of the sectors. <clears throat> In terms of the overall, from these figures here, um, tillage is around 2.5 tonnes, whereas sheep is just a little over four, Cattle are 4.5 tonnes and specialist dairy are nine and a half tonnes. You know, so we're a long ways different on a per hectare basis uh, from, from each of these. But of course, in terms of the National Farm Survey, a specialist tillage farm is classified as, as a tillage um, having around 75% of the overall income. So within most of those farms, it's probably some degree of animals on those farms. And when we go back and we break out and kind of say, well, hang on there now, we know that anything that has animals on it are a pretty leaky kind of system. So if you have cows on, on the farm, you're going to push up those emissions. So we looked into um, um, Carl Buckley from the National Farm Survey and um, took a subset of this of the specialist tillage farms and had a look at um, tillage farms with no livestock. So no livestock on, on it whatsoever. So there's no leakage from that point of view. So in that scenario, um, or in, I suppose, the realistic outputs then from a specialist tillage farm with no livestock goes from 2.5 down to 1.3 uh, uh, tonnes of CO2 equivalent per hectare in comparison to probably the highest emitter, which would be daring, which would be the guts of nine and a half tonnes per hectare. So we're, I suppose, by, by any measure, we're a, a very carbon efficient sector um, and as I said before, also relatively efficient in terms of nutrients as well. So again, a very good news, a very good news story kind of to, to, to this point. So just to say in, in terms of these emissions and how they are being calculated, they're calculated on the basis of the IPCC calculation. So really it's being, they are calculated within the farm gate, okay? So a couple of things that aren't, uh, it, there's a number of ways of doing it. You can you can compare it on, on that kind of basis of which the country um, is, is uh, calculates its own figures on. So it's whatever is in the farm gate. And the big area that certainly wouldn't be included here that would con contribute quite, quite massively to all of our sectors would be the production of fertilizer. Because fertilizers produce outside the country, those emissions that are that are involved in produ producing that fertilizer stays outside the country. So any nitrogen, phosphorus, et cetera, that comes into the, comes into or comes onto the farms, especially tillage farms, aren't counted as part of this IC IPCC calculation. Okay. So just to bear that in mind, because I want to go a little bit further, it's very hard to know from that point, right? It's 1.3 tons of CO2 equivalent per hectare. Well, what does that actually mean in terms of the uh, Irish green in comparison to everybody else. 
Working out these figures are not particularly easy. And uh, Donald O'Brien from, from Johnstown Castle certainly helped me out quite a lot in this. So these figures are calculated in a slightly different way. They're cal calculated on a life cycle analysis. So essentially what that does is that brings in more than just what's inside the farm gate. Again, it brings in the, uh, the uh, amount of carbon dioxide uh, that was used to produce fertilizers. Okay, even though they might be produced in our country, they have to be produced somewhere. So they count overall, overall on a global scale. So to go a little, so these, these figures go a little bit further. There isn't one particular um, uh, reference to, to take all of these figures from that's, that's absolutely directly comparable. But what we've done here is we've tried to compare, try to get the best of what we could in terms of what is the carbon trust, our own ones, um, the eco invert, um, the various different other um, uh, elements of it, and they're, a, they're calculated on a very similar way. So um, you can see here in from an Irish point of view when we're producing wheat, and again because we're very high yielding, this is this is a, a measure on a per kilo of dry matter basis. Okay, so it's this was used uh, for um, comparing feed types um, in in a trial. I'm going to come to later on, but it's, so this is we're going switching from a, a per hectare basis now into a per kilo. So for um, uh, wheat, uh, we're talking about 300 grams per kilo, give or take. That is where our production are. France is 420 grams. The UK can be close, somewhere between 340 and 400 uh, grams. When we move into, I suppose, a direct comparison then in terms of feeding point of view from wheat to maize, they're all very similar. You're almost talking about three times. So the imports from, from Brazil is probably three times. If it's coming into Ireland, so it's a, it's 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 a kilo for kilo. Um, Europe is a little bit less, and, and I suppose the reason to explain it behind this be, behind the these figures are that uh, it takes into account the amount of carbon that was trapped in soils and is now gone. So that can include the uh, you know the rainforest that the carbon was captured in rainforest. Uh, and the carbon captured in that soil underneath those rainforests that will over time when it's when you're used to grow crops that'll that'll be burned off in the sense of it'll be degraded by by oxygen end up in carbon dioxide and, and escape into the, to the atmosphere so that's the process why the likes of brazil are very much higher than 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 we are uh, in terms of barley very similar situation and we tend to because we've higher yields we tend to be that bit better than our our um, European neighbors, or even, even across in the UK. When we start to look at the higher protein type products, um, we grow fava beans quite well. They have a protein content of between you know, 23 to 26%, generally it's on the higher side, 25 to 26%. Um, you're talking about um, somewhere around uh, 200 grams per kilo. When you go into look at the soybeans then from Argentina, it's nearly six, um, uh, six kilos per kilo of product produced. And in Brazil, it can be hugely higher up to 14. And again, that's because of, I suppose, the destruction of some of the, some of the pristine um, uh, uh, environments that, that are out there. But we still tend to be that little bit higher and competitive when you work it back to a, 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 um, a protein base is competitive with the likes of soybean coming from um, the likes of the US. Okay, well, so if we go back again and we look up to see what actually makes up the greenhouse gas emissions uh, from, from, from tillage, um, I go to um, some slides that were, that, that were done, uh, a case study done by Gary Lanigan, our colleague here in, in, um, in Chagas, uh, who uh, went through a particular a farm, one of our farms that we work quite, quite closely with, it's about 100 hectares, has a mixture of spring, barley, winter wheat, and beans. And if you work through, and this is done on an LCA basis, so it's kind of counting everything into, into account. So if we take the um, if we take the emissions from the, um, the nitrous oxide, but also leaching has to be taken into account, we take into account the manufacturer of that N, P, and K, the manufacturer of the herbicides um, and the fuel, but also for the grain uh, or for the grain drying uh, along the way. That comes up to a figure of 812 from total emissions. And again, that gives an emission factor of in around that 330 grams per kilo of product produced. So again, it matches very well with some of those international figures. 
when we have a look at some of the mitigation uh, uh, things that can go onto that farm, stick in cover crops. A cover crop will, will, will grow between two crops. So you harvest the crop in somewhere like uh, July or August, put in another crop in there that's going to be in there for a short space of time, grows very quickly. As it grows, it captures carbon, obviously, and, obviously, and captures um, nitrates as well, um, which can be leachy, leaky down here and need to be captured as well. Um, and that can all recycle back into the system without becoming a burden to the environment. We also stick in straw incorporation then, which helps in terms of capturing uh, both carbon and also capturing um, the uh, some, some nitrates as well. So that brings down the overall emissions then down to 670. Um, so, uh, or by 670. Uh, to, to give you overall farm emissions of about 254. But then obviously there's other things that can be done, improving the management of hedgerows out there and um, letting them grow taller um, and, and wider will we'll, um, almost uh, you know, we can go from a, a, a relatively small capture of um, maybe uh, one or two tons to, to maybe three or four times that. The other side of it then, if where farms have a bit of a forest, they can add quite substantially to, to trapping nitrogen as well. So in this scenario, on this farm that had a quite a lot of hedgerows, this farm has gone from a, um, a potential um, source of carbon, so they're emitting more than it was actually, uh, actually taking in, to an actual sink in this scenario. So in this scenario, on these farms, and there's quite a few of them out there, they're intensive tillage farms, but if they do some of the right actions, manage hedgerows properly, have small bit of woodland, um, it can actually become a carbon sink. But if we're to go back then to all the other farms and have a look and kind of say, well, right, OK, well, what's the biggest area we, we, we really should have a look at? Well, if we break down some of these biggest um, carbon, um, carbon outputs from it and we have a look at it here, the manufacture of, 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 um, of nitrogen and the use of nitrogen in fields accounts for the guts of 84 percent of the overall production. So nitrogen is a very big, big driver of the CO2 emissions uh, from, from tillage. So we need to try and do everything we can to reduce those. So what can we do? So there's loads of uh, particular actions that farmers to a degree are already taking, but could do more on. Nitrogen fixing with the likes of legumes. Um, when you stick a legume into a, a rotation, say a winter rotation, stick in a winter bean into winter rotation, you can reduce the amount of nitrogen use by about 22%, and at the same time, increase protein yield by about 14%. Similarly, in a spring rotation, if you stick in a legume one in, one in five years in that, you can reduce the nitrogen by about 22% and in, increase the protein yield on that, on that area by about 25%. And if you remember, um, I, I mentioned before, uh, we are very deficit in protein and the more protein we can add back into the system, the less we have to import everybody else. In terms of organic manures, and I'm going to come to that a little bit, a little bit in a minute, and the more organic manures we put in, the less chemical uh, manures we need to put on. In terms of healthy soils here, um, obviously that's a scenario whereby if you get the uh, the pH right and the uh, the major nutrients such as phosphate, potassium, and some of the other trace elements right, it will allow the nitrogen to be used more efficiently. And if it's used more efficiently, hopefully we use use that a little bit less. The other area in terms of research we're trying to look at quite a lot is, is in terms of precision application. So we have uh, recommendations for, for each crop so you can uh, specifically apply that amount per field, but that could be a little bit more accurate. Um, not just in terms of the overall quantities being recommended, but also from the point of view of, of, of applying them accurately, targeting where, where they should be applied, whether that's a variable rate application or simply just making sure they end up on a very even pattern in the, in the field so we get the, kind of the best out of them. I mentioned cover crop's ability to, um, to trap nitrogen and carbon. You can see just from this picture here, it's, um, it's a picture here from Oak Park done by Richie Hackett. In the background, you can see quite a big uh, cover of stuff that was sown on the 30th of June, or sorry, the 30th of July, I should say. This uh, particular one was sown three weeks later. This one was sown three weeks later again. So you can see the huge differences. This is taken on October the 9th. Huge differences between the amount of material that's put in. So that, that can be perfected, if you like. I mentioned straw, straw chopping as well in terms of its ability to capture carbon. And also within fields, the likes of managing canopies is out there and oilseed rape in particular, whereby um, if we get a big quantity of oilseed rape um, in the spring, a lot of vegetation on it in the spring, that's actually trapped nitrogen over the winter, similar to our cover crops. 
and that can you you know we can end up using an awful lot less nitrogen chemical nitrogen in spring up to maybe 100 kilos so it's so it's a very good news story there where that's managed correctly um in terms of the organic manures um we did we we completed a number of figures here through this the um tillage stakeholder group and the present position uh, we estimate there's the guts of 140,000 tons of organic manures being used on tillage ground which gives around 5% of the nitrogen needs, 16 and 24% of the P and K needs of the, of the crop existingly. It also adds about 64,000 tons of carbon to back into the soil. So that helps to not just stabilize, but may, may well even add to the carbon stocks in the soil and tillage soils are quite receptive to, um, to carbon uh, from that point of view. And, and it's a really good way of ensuring the, those soils keep the amount of carbon uh, in them. So it, when you calculate it all out, the amount of, of that, those manures that, that are being recycled through the tillage ground is equivalent to about 38,000 tonnes of, um, of carbon. But we think we can go further with this. Um, we think we can increase the manures, uh, manures from, from um, and this over and above the requirements for grassland. But I suppose with some of the new nitrates directives coming in terms of the, um, the derogation for, for various different farms, more of the, these uh, nutrients are going to have to move away from, from where they, were, they have been put heretofore. So increase some of these elements uh, onto, onto the tillage ground. We can increase then the, um, the supply of nitrogen uh, phosphorus and potassium uh, up to, uh, to 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 closer to what what climb uh, what uh, the, the the crop may well require. Um, we can increase then the overall tonnage uh, of the amount of carbon saved from the non-use of chemical fertilizers, nearly double it up to seventy one thousand tons, which is which is no mean feat in any particular year. And again, add an awful lot more of this carbon back into the soil, of which will make our soils healthier and function better in the longer term and probably use the likes of those NPs and Ks that much much better all the way. So that's something I think we, we, we can certainly help in terms of the overall industry, alleviating one sector, but certainly adding, adding to ours. I mentioned cover crops there, and this just gives you an idea, some farm results from 2021. The larger the canopy you get, the more fresh weight you get, and the more nitrogen you get. And you can see this all the way along, a little bit less, you get that little bit less nitrogen. So the bigger the canopy, the more you're going to get the less of that nitrogen is available to be leached through the ground and into our rivers and estuaries. Uh, and the more can be trapped and hopefully recycled over time back into the, um, the tillage system. This table again just gives you an idea that it's not, it's not a linear type scenario. It depends where you are in the country and it depends on the type of crop you're after put, putting in. A lot of people have used the likes of rye and phacelia, um, but you can see some of the nitri nit nitrate uptakes here have been you know, relatively high. But once you get into sowing some of them quite late, the amount of nitrates that you're going, going to, to, to gather up can be on the lower side. So it is, is a, it's, a, it's a bit of a practice um, uh, a change, I suppose, or a, a practice uh, nuance, I suppose, on the ground to try and get the most out of these cover crops. Other areas we can help to reduce, certainly within the tillage sector, is um, reduce tillage, probably nearly half the, half the fuel use in those kind of systems maybe not quite somewhere there or thereabouts, consolidating farm units uh, in terms of less travel around the place, minimizing pesticides. Um, we'll certainly be trying to do that, but it, has a, it doesn't have a huge impact in terms of greenhouse gas effects. But certainly it takes a lot of energy in some years to store to, to dry very wet grain, but there's other ways of doing it to, to, to treat and store higher moisture grain, which can be uh, something that, that's well worthwhile. But obviously, education for everyone is certainly the, the, the largest ends of it. And in terms of the education, we have, again, our signpost farms out there. This just gives you an idea of the very different types of farms that we have. A lot of them you might, you might see here, we're using, using um, organic manures in growing crops, as well as using it uh, around that. Uh, we're using some no-till um, farms, min-till farms. We're trying to integrate some of the tillage um, and the best of what the um, both systems have to offer in terms of pigs and cattle in various different different parts. And uh, we're also working with malt and barley and guys really um, uh, trying, to, trying to use precision agriculture to try and improve their, um, their efficiency on farm as much as they can. These are the kind of things and I've mentioned probably most of them already in terms of trying to improve um, our, our, our tillage end of it. The farms aren't going to be really any much different in terms of minimizing the greenhouse gases, improving our water quality, 
improving the biodiversity, biodiversity, which I haven't mentioned so far, but it's certainly something that, that tillage farmers probably could improve quite a lot on. Um, we're, we, we tend to be quite uh, good in terms of um, making sure everything is clean, neat, tidy, and all hedges are very square and cut, cut terribly well, but that's probably not the way to manage biodiversity. Manage, biodiversity doesn't like to be managed, it likes to do its own thing. And obviously then within signposts and any of these kind of things, financial sustainability is, is one of the key priorities we're, we're trying to have a look at there as well. Okay, this gives you an idea of it, the performance in 2021 of our, our sign, signpost farms. They're kind of bang on average in terms of our the greenhouse gas um, carbon uh, uh, CO2 per, per, uh, per hectare. Um, they're bang on the national average. But as you can see, even though they're bang on here, they, their, their income generation is extremely good. Uh, you know, driving from very high yields in the farm. So even though they're they're, and this is why I suppose it's great that, that farmers here and the industry, I suppose, in general, should come and have a look at these farms over the next number of years. They are very average farms that we're trying to bring uh, in terms of greenhouse gases, but with high yields that we're trying to bring along a, a good bit further. And with all of these kind of actions that we're trying to put onto all of these farms. A couple of last points um, I just want to mention here is that Look, Ireland in, in has a low greenhouse gas uh, uh, for you know per kilo of Irish grain produced. How can that help the livestock sector? I mentioned before we we produce about two million tons of of our own concentrate uh, of our own grain that ends up in the concentrate going into animal feed. We import, and this is the figures from 2014 to 2018, about three and a half million tons. That can be as high as five million tons in 2018 to add to our own to go into various different. Um, concentrates for, for animal feed. So there's a huge amount of, of grain being imported. That grain, so uh, that grain, I suppose, is being imported from over 60 countries. So because it comes from 60 countries, we really don't have an idea where exactly it comes from uh, in lots of cases, because it's certainly not on the on the, the label of, of um, uh, that a farmer would see on the ground in terms of all the various different ingredients in, in some of these rations. They're not going to see um, exactly where that came from. In a general sense, we're only about 36% um, self-sufficient in animal concentrates. From the National Farm Survey, uh, quite a, near almost half of all farmers um, agree that their economic future depends on their willingness to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So that's a really good starting point. Chagas did a little bit of research um, around winter milk and where the imported feed was replaced with a uh, native feed. Um, we uh, the in that uh, they were able to reduce the uh, carbon footprint of milk by 32 percent with a, a slightly lower yield is only is only very slight but the report uh, would show that uh, that that deficit can be can be made up from from a little a little bit more balancing um, but i suppose the main figure to to have a look at here is 32 percent lower now that if that can happen in dairy that can certainly happen in in uh, in, in pigs or poultry as well uh, you know, it's, it's very much a, an area where um, Irish farmers, Irish tillage farmers have been talking about for a long time, but I, I suppose their gripe would be they're not, not really getting any great recognition for that in terms of the, um, the, the, the value going, going out. The last kind of one I want to kind of mention here is that I, I mentioned it earlier on, and you might remember this map which showed uh, where all the, where all the tillage, uh, where all the tillage, um, tillage sector is in these kind of colored areas here. Essentially, that's the cropland in, in Ireland. So what's cycling in and cycling out of tillage is about 738,000 hectares. Continuous tillage is about 360, but temporary grassland makes up the rest of it. From an IPCC point of view, or from a national inventory point of view, um, the it, all of that ground, the cropland, is regarded as cropland. And whether it goes in or out of tillage doesn't make any real difference to the overall inventories. But obviously, if we were to put all of the cropland back into tillage, we would have to displace animals out of that. And if we were to do that, it's pretty straight line calculation from a national inventory point of view. It's one minus the other. And for every hectare that goes out, it's about a 3.6 uh, tons per hectare better off going into tillage in terms of in terms of the carbon emissions. But we did it a little bit differently. We, 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 we came back and had a look at it in terms of a, maybe a more field scale basis. So in a mineral soil, and I will talk about mineral soils rather than peat soils because they're they're a bit trickier. Uh, in mineral soils, um, long-term grass tends to capture or has a lot of stored carbon in it. But where you put grass in for a year, uh, it, a lot of that carbon tends to be to, to, to be lost very quickly. 
or if you put in grass for half the time over a 20 year period it's a little bit less or if you go for tillage one in four years it tends to be that little bit less in comparison to tillage so there's a there's tillage ground uh, uh, will have lower uh, carbon stocks than very long-term permanent grassland but there's a bit of bit to play with in the middle so if you convert long-term grassland um, out of um, uh, grassland into tillage, you will lose a lot of those stocks over time. Whereas on some of the some of the ground that have been recycling in and out of tillage, there's an awful lot less to lose. And that's kind of this area around here, okay? So if we look at this, this in particular, if we look at this ground here, that's temporary grassland that is, um, that is, is rotating in and out of tillage one in every four years. And if we do, if you, we do a number of figures on that, um, that the difference between the, the, the it, so there's probably two, two bits of calculations in it. One is that we're going to lose uh, a, a bit of carbon in the first uh, two or three years um, of, because you're converting out of grass into tillage. But on the other side of it then, because the livestock aren't there, livestock are pretty leaky. And the difference between the dry stock and tillage um, in terms of emissions is about 3.6 tons of carbon equivalent per hectare. So when you balance those all up and you do the calculations out, in year number four, the tillage is now positive. So for every year from year four onwards, converting that grassland from grassland to tillage, there's a saving of, of, of 3.6 tonnes of carbon equivalent every year. If that was to happen on 5% on of the current area, of which pretty much happened this year, that again is a saving of about 64,000 tonnes of carbon. OK, so look, I'm getting towards the end. The concluding remarks here is that, look, we are very carbon efficient. And look, this is a good news story, really, from a tillage sector point of view. We're very carbon efficient. There's good financial returns just below daring. And I suppose more crucially, there's a good quality of life associated with that. Um, the intensive tillage farms can be carbon sinks rather than sources, which, which, which is really good to know from that point of view. And um, the uh, increasing tillage area can reduce greenhouse gases naturally, nationally. It's not going to add to them, certainly. And uh, from the point of, uh, we, we do produce low greenhouse grains in the country, which can help the livestock industry. I suppose certainly from the marketing point of view, I'm sure of that a little bit, but also display some of the imports coming into our ag system, thereby making it all more resilient. Uh, and that's, that's, that's about it. Thanks very much, Pat. Um, and look, I just want to say uh, a huge thanks to some of my colleagues who contributed to this. Donald O'Brien, Cahill Buckley, the, the National Farm Survey team, um, and also the Tillage, uh, Chagas Tillage Stakeholder Group. A couple of other things there just in the bottom. We have a Tillage Edge podcast just to tell everyone about. You can listen in every week and our, uh, some of the other information you can get there. Okay, Pat. Thank you very much, Michael. You might stop sharing there. You will. Yep. That's great. And Jay, you might... Uh, join us there. Uh, I suppose uh, fascinating insight into the potential of, of, of tillage. Are you setting a target for the signpost farms that they would be uh, effectively carbon neutral or what is the target that you have for them? We have a carbon target. Oh, we hope to bring them from about 1.3 down, down to about one, uh, okay. one ton of greenhouse gas. Yeah, but we hope that we will have two to three of those farms that will be close to zero. That's where we're hoping to get them to. Okay, and I suppose there's there's a has been a lot of talk about the potential of of uh, tillage and uh, for for both import substitution and uh, uh, for uh, the the uh, reducing of our our overall emissions. Uh, and I think you've alluded to th that potential and how that potential might be implemented in in a, in a fairly practical way. What are the steps that you see that need to to be taken if we are going to to achieve that? Well, look, I mean, I could be overly enthusiastic and kind of say we could do everything. We can't. We don't have the the overall area in the country. So as I said, we produce about two million tons of feed grains. With, there's a requirement for probably another two million, give or take. So we're a long ways from producing all of that. But I think huge help and a number of different companies have done it already. Um, uh, one in the southeast and one down in, down in the south, whereby they're actually producing all Irish grains, so grains with all native feeds in it. So I suppose really it does come back to labelling. It does come back to farmers knowing what they're putting in and making a conscious decision to choosing uh, Irish rather than choosing imported. But I suppose, look, when it's all come back to it, um, it does come back to supporting the um, our exports of, of uh, whether it's meat or, or dairy products. 
because it needs to, it needs to come back into supply chain so that Irish tillage farmers are getting some sort of return for that. Okay, Shay, uh, I remind people to to continue to put in your questions. A, a, a lot of questions starting to come in there. Yeah, Pat, there is uh, just one point, Michael. I suppose the first question that came in early on in the presentation, you mentioned it subsequently. I suppose, in terms of growing more pulses, can we take advantage of the demand for more protein crops, likes of peas and beans, not just for animal feed, but also for meat based and non meat based alternatives? We can. There's absolutely huge potential for that, and that's certainly the area that we would be targeting um, uh, to to try and try and increase that. I suppose there's a couple of things in that. One is that there's a huge recognition and a huge um, increase, I suppose, of, of plant-based protein being, being used out there. Um, but we need to get it in the form that, uh, that companies want to use it in. So there's a bit of processing kind of needed in that. And from an Irish point of view, we don't have that processing capacity uh, as it stands at, at the moment. But that's something that certainly we, we're working very hard in research. There's the guts of 20 million euros being put into research at the moment in that particular area. Um, using some of the technologies um, that are being employed in, in harvesting protein from milk. Similar processes can be used so we can upscale some of those proteins to, to really go for uh, some of those high value markets. Yeah, Michael, and there's a comment in here which kind of probably actually leads to a question uh, in terms of the tillage sector being starting from a lower point in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. But is there a danger there that maybe we're kind of, there might be fear that tillage farmers might sit under the laurels and say, listen, we're a lot cleaner than other sectors and say we don't have to do as much but I suppose that's not what we're going with the signpost farms we're trying to drive them on even further yeah I mean look we we, we could say look we're we're, we're 1.3 in comparison to dairy which is nine and a half isn't that fantastic aren't we great and let's let's all go home and 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 do it up but look as I outlined there there's a number of different practices there that they're they're, they're I suppose very similar to some of the um uh some of the uh solutions that are being proposed for the livestock industry they're not just about cost they're actually going to be um you know beneficial in the long term the likes of cover crops for instance they'll trap carbon on one side they'll trap nitrates that are going to be leached on the other side which should be leached which, which can be recycled back into the system but it's also good for soil health so it has it's a win-win-win kind of basis all the way along so we will certainly be um working with all those signpost farmers to um i suppose look there's three elements to it it's not just about the environment a lot of the elements that we're going to put in place will hopefully add to the bottom line as well. Yeah, there's a question here, Michael. I'm not sure whether you're best placed to answer now, or whether Gary or maybe even Catherine Keenan might be more qualified to, to answer it. What percentage of hedgerows will be needed to have a carbon sink on a normal, normal tillage farm where there's no woodland? In other words, how many metres of hedgerows would need to be, to be there? I think it's, it's not a straight, just a straight line question. I think it's the way they're managed as well will also have an impact. I suppose, look, it comes down to field size. That's what it comes down to. Um, and Catherine Keena would, would, would tell us that um, from a tillage point of view, our fields are too big and we need to we have more, way more hedges in them. In, that, in the example that we had there, um, there, was, there was a very extensive uh, amount of um, uh, hedgerows on those fields. The average field size was only about seven or eight acres, so it's not big in comparison to probably double that size in most farms. But even all of those that were there still weren't good enough to offset all of the emissions that were there. So even in that scenario, and only any tillage farmer would like to go for anything less than about seven or eight acres. So, so it's, it's, it's hedgerows and other additional measures as well. No one thing can actually get them there. Yeah, there's two questions here, Michael, which are kind of related as well in terms of kind of mining soils and some of the movements that are going on at the moment. Some regen farms are undersowing crops for clover which is one measure that they're actually doing, but a lot of them are using cover crops as well. So, and in terms of managing those cover crops, is it better to leave them in situ until you're ready to harvest or is it just drill or are you better off to graze them off? Well, I, I suppose, look, it, it comes down It comes down to, look, on a day like today, everyone woke up this morning, it was about uh, half eight before it got bright, certainly in my house anyways, at least anyways, and it'll be dark at around half four. What, we, what tends to beat us, I suppose, this time of the year is light. Um, so everything really has stopped growing because of light as much as anything else. So by the time you get to the 1st of December, that's it. We pretty much are not going to have anything else. And after that, you can recycle those um, crops back through, uh, through livestock. Uh, that'll be through um, to urine and feces. And uh, you will lose maybe a little bit through, through meat. But there's nothing, no harm in recycling that, uh, in that way. The other way to do it, I suppose, and it can be a little bit longer, is, is uh, plowing them down or cultivating them back in. And it's probably two small ends of that. The, 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 the greener they are, the more leaf they have, the quicker they recycle back, 
the more woody or stemmy they are, the longer term, more it'll take them longer to break down and much longer for them to recycle back into the system. Michael, uh, just to follow on from that, the the, the um, regeneration through a, a light tilling in in the uh, or after post harvest, have you any figures on the relative uh, benefits of that compared to putting in a catch crop? In terms of the nitrogen leaching part, of, I presume is what what you're talking about. Um, so from a nitrogen nitrate leaching part, point of view, um, and again a catch crop, there's catch crops and there's catch crops as you've seen in seen in that. If you sow a catch crop in um, somewhere in the 1st of August, for every three weeks delayed sowing that catch crop, you lose about two tonnes of dry matter per hectare. So you get from a very big crop to a very small crop and so on all the way across. So if you sow a catch crop way into September, you're going to get very little. If you just sow a cultivate in around the same time, um, the differential is about to get about 70 to 80% of the nutrient capture in the natural regeneration as you would with, it, with a sown catch crop. So it can be quite effective. Okay. Michael, just a question there in terms of, uh, we're all aware of probably more of climate change now than where we would have been even three, four years ago. Are we going to see, do you think, uh, more disease pressure, more pest pressure uh, over the next number of years? And I suppose that's linked in with another question here in terms of pesticide usage. And you mentioned it in the presentation about uh, the contribution of pesticide uses and maybe where the direction of travel in terms of plant protection products is going over the next number of years in, in, in Europe. Yeah, look, it is going to be tricky. Um, but there, there is a, in terms of the amount of pesticides that can be uh, that that are going to be registered for use will reduce over time, and that's that's certain. We know that is happening. But look, fundamentally, there's not a tillage farmer out there that I know of wants to put a pesticide on willingly. Uh, they all cost money, and they would all prefer not to have to do it. They really, all farmers are really only applying what's absolutely necessary because it all costs money and it hits, hits their farm, lead, farm income at the end of the day. In terms of climate change, yes, we can see some changes. We can see some differences. We can see that it is getting milder uh, or it's continuing milder, certainly for this year and last year, continuing milder for much longer into, into the, um, the back end. Um, spring seem to be slightly different in terms of it tends to be that a little bit colder over the last number of years. So there's changes happening on the ground already. The best I, I suppose port of call we're going to have in terms of trying to adapt to that is the varieties we use, the types of crops we use um, to try and get our genetics as good as we can. So in the last couple of years, we've had genetics coming through that are tolerant to BYDV or a virus that can get into barley, which can help to minimize um, uh, inputs of, of, of pesticides, but also helps more resilience of the crop in, in a general sense. Ewan Mullins talked last week about um, disease resistance in potatoes and disease resistance in, in wheat and romaine crops. The better resilience or the be better genetics we have, the less pesticides we're, we're going to have to apply. And, and to be honest with you, I think farmers for the most part will be delighted if they could apply very little of any pesticides. The other, the regen, and we mentioned it before in terms of regenerative agriculture, um, regenerative agriculture, generally speaking, relies on a non-plowed based system. So plowed based systems have been used for an awful long time because they tend to be quite flexible. You can plow pretty much this time of year if the ground's relatively dry enough, get a crop in and away you go. You can't really do that in some of the regen systems. So what that does is that's pushing their systems earlier in the year, which tends to lead to greater pressure from whether it's viruses and um, whether it's weed control or whether it's diseases. So all of those make it trickier. So there's a balancing act between both systems, if you like, to try and make sure we get the best of everything. Yeah, so it's not a, it's not a, a panacea, if you like. Uh, no. in, in there, there's a question there, or a, a comment. It says, excellent presentation. It would be great to see better collaboration between livestock and tillage sector, whereby livestock sector would use more uh, native uh, grown cereals, a win-win for all. I suppose that leads to a question. Is there a potential for us from a marketing uh, uh, perspective to uh, uh, look at, I suppose, a, a totally Irish generated food system, uh, uh, whereby we're, we're much more, uh, uh, I suppose, le are much less dependent on, on, on imports and, and selling our product on that basis. Do you see an opportunity there? Look, there is, uh, and I suppose that's, that's why I, I went at it from a number of different directions. One is that we, the differences that's going to be made in terms of greenhouse gas of bringing more ground into a tillage system is negligible. It's actually on a positive. 
um, the resulting grain that can be produced from that can displace imports. So look, we're importing the guts of a million tons, give or take one year with the other of maize here and there. Wheat can directly um, uh, substitute for that without any, without any great problem at all. So there is certainly more of a potential to feed that into the system. The bit that we can that we, the bit we'll struggle with, not that we can't, but the bit we're going to struggle with, Pat, I think, is um, producing enough protein. The overall system is a little bit deficit in protein, and it is hard for us to produce enough in total because we the demands are actually quite high. But that being said, your idea of producing a, a, an entire supply chain is quite a good one. If we look at maybe the dairy sector, um, the, 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 from a summer or for a spring calving herd, they don't use nearly as much concentrates as maybe a winter calving herd. And therefore, you may well be able to get um, to get an entire system in there with, with an Irish supply chain in, into that. But look, that would take quite a huge amount of effort and maybe in a particular area to make sure that happens reasonably well. There's, there's a good few comments and, and suggestions and uh, queries in relation to a kind of the, the, the nitrate element or the water quality element. Uh, I think maybe in the new year, it might be a, an idea to come back and, and, and to have a look at, at, at that as a, as a specific topic. I think there's a, a lot of questions uh, potentially there. Uh, in terms of, of uh, the push for protected urea, uh, do you see uh, it's, it's it being something that's important for uh, uh, the tillage sector? Uh, I know that the uh, losses from can are lower in tillage than they are in, on, on grassland, uh, but where do you see that going? Well, the from the from, from the point of view of um, the uh, urea, protected urea, the differential in terms of overall greenhouse gas between protected urea and can, as we normally use, are actually quite small. The real big difference really happens in a grassland situation where you're really trying to, um, it's a kind of a wetter kind of soil in that, in that setup. So is it as important in a tilly, tilly sense? Not, not as much. Is there a small little bit in it? There is. Uh, and where uh, the balance comes in is because we, the tillage sector generally works in very wide tram lines, whereas the dairy sector doesn't, or the, the grassland sector doesn't. So going up to 24 or even 30 meters, it can often be that little bit trickier to try and evenly spread the fertilizer out that width. And I suppose, as I mentioned before, one of the, 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 the real ways of trying to make sure that we, we get best efficiency of nitrogen is to make sure it's the right amount supplied to the right area. So you don't want to end up using a different product that you can't apply particularly well. So the differences might be, they're, they're small, some people can use them, but it's not, it's not as big an issue as it would be maybe in the livestock area. Okay, maybe a couple of quick final questions. Yeah, Michael, uh, one here in terms of, you mentioned the effect that climate change is going to have on tillage. Do you think we'll be able to continue producing these high yields? And you mentioned about the, the temporary grassland in there. Can we actually expand the uh, area of tillage growing to actually reduce the amount of reliance on imports? Yeah, interestingly enough that when you talk to uh, some of our colleagues down in Johnstown Castle, when you get into a, a, a drought year, um, grassland turns from a, 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 a sink for carbon into a source of carbon. It actually flips around. From a tillage point of view, when we get into a drought situation, um, yes, it becomes more difficult, but, but everything is going to become more difficult in, in, in a drought situation. However, again, we would turn to um, the likes of some of our winter cropping um, tends to be more resilient. And certainly over time, we will, and we continue to look at the resilience of um, systems are resilient of, of the uh, varieties and the genetics that are coming through to try and ensure that they were getting the very best from those to, to, to kind of put up with this uh, climate change differences. Okay, uh, I think we're going to have to cut it there. It's an unbelievably quick hour. Uh, and thanks very much to, to Michael. And I, I think we have uh, a, a topic that we need to return to. And as, as I say, we've mentioned the, the, the nitrate issue, and that I think that's one that we need to look at in, uh, from a tillage perspective. So thank you very much both to, to Michael and, and, and uh, Shay. I think a lot of compliments coming in, Michael, in relation to the quality of the, the presentation. And I think it's it's a, a, a something that uh, I suppose we haven't focused on to a huge degree is the, is the whole tillage sector. So I think we've a, a little bit more work to do there. Uh, we're finished for uh, 2022, so there's no uh, webinar for, for the next two weeks. Uh, we'll be back in the first Friday of, of January, uh, where we'll have uh, uh, um, um, John McNamara on implementing health and safety and sustainable, and sustainable farming systems. 
So until then, I would like to wish you all a very happy Christmas. I'd like to, to thank our, our production team of Yvonne and, and Andy for all their work uh, throughout the year and wish you a, a, a very happy Christmas and stay safe till we see you again in, in January. Thanks, Pat.